What is going on everybody? It is so good to be back. It's been a little quiet on the channel, so I appreciate you guys' patience. It was a hell of a week, and it's setting up to be a hell of a week moving forward as well. Last week, a lot happened. I want to thank everybody. We reached 50,000 subscribers last week, kind of quietly, because I've been working on my Madden roster, not making videos. Uh, but thank you, everyone. That was my big goal for the year. Uh, so excited to kind of you know celebrate that here as we look forward to the next season with this predictions show that is always one of my favorite videos every year. Other big news. Thank you, everyone, for the love and support. Uh, I got engaged this week, believe it or not. My beautiful girlfriend, Anna, shout out to her. Thank you, everyone, um, for your congratulations. It means a lot, and I am just so excited for the year moving forward, and I'm excited for this week moving forward. We got the prediction show here. We're going to have my weekly picks here on YouTube this week. We're going to have a podcast that I want uh, you guys to take your reactions to the mailbag for that podcast this week. Uh, lots of exciting stuff ahead. The season starts on Thursday. Let's get into it. Please do hit that like button if you enjoy when this is all said and done. All right, as we normally do, let's start in the NFC North. At the bottom, I am sorry, Lions fans, I'm not buying in. I do have the Detroit Lions last place yet again. I know it's a theme over history, but history does have a pattern of repeating itself. I just don't see the continuity there for Detroit. I don't fully believe in Matt Patricia. I think this is going to be a tough team to beat, and they're going to have some big explosive wins when things are clicking, but I just question on if they can get everything clicking over the course of a 16-game season. Third place, I have the Chicago Bears. Unfortunately for Bears fans, they are giving the nod to Mitch Trubisky yet again. And what is the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? That's very much how I feel about that. I know this Bears defense is going to be one of the best in the league, and they're going to be able to win games because of that. 8-8 eight eight is a respectable record. But I just see this going as so predictable. Four or five weeks of Trubisky, them continuing to plant their flag on a, a lost cause in Trubisky. And it's not that Nick Foles is some savior, but I do think they have a higher floor and could actually be a better football team down the stretch with Nick Foles. And they would just be sitting there saying, man, we really like those one or two wins that we might have had with Nick Foles that could have gotten us into the playoffs. And I think that's just going to be how this season plays out for Chicago. And then we have the Minnesota Vikings in second place. I do think this is a very good football team. I have a lot of questions about them. They just acquired Yannick Ngakwe, a big topic that I want to hit in on in depth on my upcoming podcast this week. But there are some pretty major questions for this team, notably in the secondary, particularly with the cornerback room, a lot of youth in a complex Mike Zimmer defense that runs a lot of different coverages. I do think they will have their learning curves, to say the least, in the secondary. Most notably, though, this offense it's a good offense and it works a lot of time but it's cliche but you gotta build to beat your division and this is an offense with Kirk Cousins and a lackluster offensive line that has really struggled against Green Bay and Chicago two of the best pass rushes in the entire league when you have Kirk Cousins who can't move when you have a poor offensive line that is a recipe for disaster and those are four games that I actually have Minnesota losing all of them. They do not match up well with the best teams in this division. I think it does hurt them. Uh, so I have them going nine and seven, a uh, very good football team, but I think they're gonna fall short this year. Then I have Green Bay at 12 and four, uh, first place in the NFC North. The narrative for this team is that they got lucky. They were the worst 13 win team in NFL history last year. And while that may be true, you can't go the complete other way and like I've seen from many out there just say oh they're an average team that got lucky are they the same Packers that we used to know where Aaron Rodgers was lighting up the scoreboard carrying bad rosters no they're actually completely different they're a conservative running offense that takes shots in play action with a top defense but is that a fluky way to get to 11, 12 wins? No, it's really not, especially when this team did improve over the offseason, while not to the degree that they maybe could have through the draft. But the defense will only be better when you really stack things up. And on offense, it's going to look better. Uh, it really can't look much worse than it was last year. You're going to have 
obviously Devontae Adams, but you get Alan Lazard in there from day one. You get Equinemius St. Brown, who I said last year was the only competent NFL caliber receiver on that roster after Devontae Adams. You have those two. You have Jay Sternberger, who's better than Jimmy Graham. You have Robert Tanyan, who's better than Jimmy Graham. You get A.J. Dillon in the mix. The offense will have more to work with this year. I think Green Bay will be a better team last year, despite uh, having a worse record prediction here. On to the NFC East, and this is probably the hottest take in this video. I have the New York Giants going 1-15 with a train wreck season, and I will also predict that they will be selecting Trevor Lawrence in the NFL draft, whether that be in April, May, or June. That's to be determined, but I think the Giants are setting up for a train wreck of a season. Offensively, they'll probably be okay, but I did not like the hiring of a Joe Judge just has a lot to prove to me. But most importantly, Jason Garrett, really, he's the guy that's going to come in and save you from, you know, Daniel Jones's turnover issues. I think they'll have some explosive games on offense, but Daniel Jones has to prove that he isn't this Jameis Winston turnover wreck that he was last year. And then, especially on the defensive side of the ball, this I think will be a historically bad defense. You have a complete schematic overhaul. They're going with this Belichick defense. We saw Detroit really struggle with this transition, and Detroit had a lot better roster. The Giants lost their best pass rusher, and Marcus Golden did not replace him. They downgraded at the linebacker room, uh, signing Blake Martinez to be the savior, potentially the biggest liability uh, of any player on any team in the NFL who has a starting role, is a black hole in the middle of that defense that offensive coordinators can target and exploit. And in the secondary, DeAndre Baker and Janoris Jenkins weren't great, but that was all they had. And the secondary is going to be a wreck this year as well uh, with a young secondary, but certainly unproven. So I think the Giants are going to be an absolute disaster. I think they will be the worst team in the NFL this year. Next up, we've got the Washington professional football team at 4-12. and It's kind of a rebuild here. I do think the defense will make some noise, but I am so worried about this offense. Such a polarizing team. I think this could be a really good defense, but I don't know how far that's going to go when you have a bad offensive line, no no skill players outside of Terry McLaurin, and a, and a quarterback in Dwayne Haskins that I, I think very much needs to prove himself this year to a new regime here that did not draft him. I, I do kind of believe in him, and I'm excited to see this team play out, but I don't know if it's going to result in a lot of wins, despite them being kind of a tough out. Then we have the Dallas Cowboys coming in second at 10-6, and six, actually um, just losing out on tiebreakers to the Philadelphia Eagles, who are also 10-6. and six. This, to me, is the tightest race amidst any kind of divisional rivals. I think these guys are really neck and neck, and it's going to be a matter of a couple plays, a couple injuries, I am giving the nod to Philadelphia here, but let's talk about Dallas first. A really good football team, potentially the best roster in the uh, NFC. The question just comes down to Dak Prescott, and a lot of people love him. The analytics love him, and he's going to light up the scoreboard and hit open receivers and let his guys make plays against the worst teams in the league. There's no doubt about it. Their point differential probably will be crazy again this year because the talent here is just going to kick bad teams' ass, but when the lights are brightest, when they need that critical third and nine, or inversely, when you got to come out strong against a team like Green Bay, New Orleans, Minnesota, Philadelphia, can they do it? Dak Prescott, to me, has so much to prove. Yeah, his numbers were crazy. Well, so were Andy Dalton's when he had a similar cast in 2015. There's a reason to me that Dallas has not extended Dak Prescott, and it's because Jerry wants a quarterback that can win him a Super Bowl, and I don't know if that is Dak Prescott. So big year for Dak for me. And then for Philadelphia, a loaded roster that's already getting um, depleted from injuries. I think they've really done a good job to uh, weather the storm on that offensive line. I talked about when they drafted some of these guys, like a Jack Driscoll, that you never know when those offensive injuries, uh, those offensive line injuries are going to hit, and you got to be ready to brace for it. And they have. They brought Jason Peters back, which is going to help brace uh, either at guard or tackle wherever he ends up lining up. And this is a team that has actually really been better when their back is against the wall. They're used to doing it. And if they can just get healthy moving forward with Carson Wentz and, and an offense that I think is really going to open up this year, that was their clear you know, goal for the offseason was we're going to bring in speed, we're going to start lighting up this scoreboard, uh, letting Carson Wentz get the ball downfield. And they've lost a lot of those pieces already, but uh, if they can get some of these guys healthy, like Rager, keep Deshaun Jackson healthy, I think that's going to be big for this offense to match the potential of this defense. 
Uh, so let's move on to the NFC South. I've got Carolina going two and 14. It's just going to be a tough year for them, uh, especially in a, in a tough division, a really tough and, and deep NFC. Teddy Bridgewater is going to have his hands full. I think his defense uh, has a lot of potential for the future, but a lot of young players, they're going to struggle early. They could very well surprise and, and you know surpass this and get four or five wins. I just, I just don't think they're the best football team uh, for 2020. Then we've got the Atlanta Falcons coming in at seven and nine. Just kind of another so-so season for them. This offense is going to be explosive. I don't trust the defense. They really need a lot of things to go right for them to truly compete in the NFC South this year. Then I've got Tampa Bay at 10 and 6, and I, I do think they're going to have a bit of a slow start. They have so many new pieces coming in here. They kind of got to rechange this offense. Tom Brady's always been a guy, um, not only like the Patriots starting slow over, over years past, but uh, Tom Brady really relies on that chemistry with these receivers in a weird COVID season. I think Tampa Bay is, is going to finish the year as a much better team than 10 and 6, but I do think they'll struggle early with a bit of a tough schedule to kick off. So I've got the the Bucks going 10 and 6 and then the Saints taking home uh the what's going to be the one seed at 12 and 4 just such a ridiculously loaded roster you know probably the most surprising team in the NFC if they don't win 10 11 games the only real question here is you know Drew Brees arm strength but certainly not enough uh, to hold them back in the regular season, I don't think. Uh, then the NFC West, I've got the Arizona Cardinals in fourth place, but at eight and eight, I really like the NFC West this year. These guys are really gonna um, feed off each other and uh, compete a lot this year. I think the Cardinals in, in a different um, you know scenario, if they were in the AFC East or the AFC South, NFC East, I think they'd have a much better chance of competing for a playoff spot, but it's gonna be so tough in this NFC West. I do think Kyler Murray is a great bet for MVP, and I would love to see them, you know, really blow up. I just, I think that the ask is a little bit too much. They might be a year away here, but I can't think of a, a team that I'm much more excited to watch this year than the Arizona Cardinals. Then we got the Rams. Uh, their schedule is actually surprisingly easy. The NFC West, while they do have to play each other, they do get the benefit of playing the AFC East. And I have most of these guys going 4-0 against the AFC East. So I actually have the Rams at 10-6. and I think they're a team that, um, you know, is, is kind of getting forgotten about because they were so overrated heading into last year, but they had a lot of things go wrong. And I think they're going to actually be a really solid team in 2020, even if they aren't a true Super Bowl contender. And I also have this weird gut feeling that Van Jefferson is going to be like one of the storylines of the year, similar to last year's Terry McLaurin. I, I just, I'm really impressed with what we've seen and heard about from Van Jefferson so far. Uh, then second place, San Francisco at 11 and five, the injuries stacking up early Super Bowl hangovers. It's, it's almost proof and, and evidence at this point. Uh, they're going to be a really good football team with Kyle Shanahan. Most of the pieces still intact here. Uh, that defense might have some adjustment to, um, you know, losing Buckner in the middle there uh, and just a lot of injuries spread out throughout the team right now. So I, I do think that they'll bounce back, maybe a bit of a slower start, but it is going to cost them the division because I got Seattle winning the division at 11 and five. A lot of hype for Seattle. They're starting to put more and more talent around Russell Wilson. They just brought Josh Gordon back. If the offensive line can just be okay here, Seattle to me is an 11 or 12 win playoff team, even in a tough NFC West. So on to the AFC side of things, uh, starting in the AFC North, we got the Cleveland Browns going six and 10, lots of talent, very well could surprise. I just am not comfortable picking them to put it all together until I see it. There are some hidden holes on this roster. I don't love the interior defensive line. I don't love the secondary. I don't love the linebackers. And I don't fully trust Baker and this offense to really click, especially in what's gonna be a completely overhauled scheme this year. It very well could happen. I'm just not going to predict it. Then we got Cincinnati in third place with the same record at six and 10. It's gonna be an interesting team to watch this year. One of the better receiving cores in the league if AJ Green is healthy. Obviously Joe Burrow, the number one overall pick. It, to me, it just comes down to this offensive line. If, if they can be just an average offensive line, Cincinnati could make a lot of noise this year. 
but I do think it's going to be a really tough year for a rookie quarterback in Joe Burrow. Now, he was one of the best processors that I've ever seen coming out of college. So um, as far as getting up to speed with the NFL level, and he did play in the SEC, I, I do think that um, it, it's a little different for him than um, someone coming out of a different conference or a, a different prospect that didn't show the mental sides of the game that Burrow did. But still, a rookie in a weird COVID season, I, it could lead to a, at least a slower start. But I do like the Bengals this year. Uh, then the Steelers at 11 and 5. I, I predict them to have one of the best defenses in the league. This really just comes down to how much do you believe in Big Ben? I think he's going to be a shell of what he once was, but I think he's still going to be a very serviceable uh, starting caliber quarterback. And I like what this team has done, putting a lot of catch and run targets around him. Guys like Deontay Johnson, these running backs, they get Chase Claypool, who's going to be an efficient short to intermediate beast, I think, used a lot like a tight end here. Eric Ebron, they realize this is not going to be a vertical passing game. But if they can be a death by a thousand cuts offense and have a great defense, that's going to be a hell of a football team. Then we got the Baltimore Ravens at 11 and five. I do expect some natural regression here. They were uh, overall pretty remarkably healthy. We've really never seen a rushing offense that was so historic, um, especially repeat the next year. I think they're going to have to learn some new tricks. I think Tennessee showed uh, a little bit of a staple for containing that read option. So I do think they will show some new tricks. I just don't know if it's going to be the explosive efficiency that we saw last year, um, but not to completely talk down on them. I think their defense is going to be better than it was last year. I have them winning the AFC North. And ultimately, they might be a better football team, more equipped for a playoff win this year and win a lot less games in the regular season. Then in the AFC East, I've got the Miami Dolphins at 4-12. and 12. I, I don't think they're ready. I didn't particularly love their offseason. I think they overpaid for some free agents. I think they overdrafted a lot of guys. And we'll see when we see Tua. Ultimately, that's going to be what you want to see at some point here is can he get out there and look like a future franchise quarterback. I personally have my doubts about that. You can go back to my draft analysis on Tua if you really are curious why. Uh, it's really just a wait and see year for the Miami Dolphins. Ultimately, though, I, I, I don't think that they have the roster talent uh, to truly hang in the NFL this year. Then we got the New York Jets at 6-10. and 10. It, It's really unfortunate that uh, we're now in year three with Sam Darnold, and, and things have not really gotten better as far as uh, giving him an opportunity to actually, you know, demonstrate what his talents are. Like, when you don't have help, it's, it's just terribly difficult. It's the same thing with uh, what happened with what's happening with Dwayne Haskins right now. Uh, but you got to do what, what the Giants have done, what the Broncos have done, what the Chiefs did with Mahomes, what the Ravens have done with Lamar. you gotta, you got to build around your young quarterback, and the Jets are doing, doing such a bad job of it. They've had some tough opt-outs. So, you know, C.J. Mosley is going to be a, a hit for that defense. I think they'll be an average football team because I do like the defense under Greg Williams, and Donald's going to make some pretty explosive plays and uh, keep you in some games, I think. Uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm just not fully buying into the Jets. Then we got the Patriots at second place at 10 and six. I think they're going to have a bit of a slow start trying to figure out what they want to do with Cam Newton. Belichick's always taken this, you know, use September to as like a preseason, especially in this year. I think we're going to see a rough start for the Patriots, but really start to click uh, and on defense as well. They just have a lot of new pieces in there. So it's, it's not going to be the same Patriots team that we're used to, but I do think they'll be highly competitive. Uh, and get hot down the stretch. And definitely a fun year uh, to see what this team looks like without Tom Brady. Then we've got the Buffalo Bills in first place, though, at 10-6, and six, just getting that tiebreaker over the Patriots. So a tight race there. The Bills are just such a solid football team. One of the deepest rosters in the league, just maybe not as top-heavy. Going to come down to Josh Allen and, and what he looks like this year, obviously. Uh, but a lot of talent here in a pretty bad division. I think they can get to 10 wins, and it just happened to be that they won the division there with the tiebreakers. Then the AFC South, tight division this year outside of Jacksonville. This is all about Gardner Minshew and letting young players play and uh, honestly, you know, building a, a new culture here. I know it's a lot of the same uh, guys as far as leadership with the staff go, but I think they've done a pretty good job of actually, you know, getting rid of the guys that didn't want to be there. Guys like Ronnie Harrison, Yannick Ngakwe, obviously Jalen Ramsey, Leonard Fournette, all these guys that were bitching and moaning about the Jags organization. They said, yeah, we're, we're not a perfect organization, but if you don't want to be here, 
Like you're just you're just gonna hurt our organization. So I, I think that they've done a good job. We saw Josh Allen tweet today, like I'm proud to be a Jaguar. They're trying to build something here. They're gonna get a lot of young guys going. I think Gardner's gonna do some things, but ultimately I think they're gonna be picking pretty high and probably taking one of these uh, young quarterbacks in next year's cla- uh, draft. Then we have a three-way tie uh, record-wise. Uh, between the Texans, Titans, and Colts. This is a tough division to break down. So to me, the Texans, they happen to come in third place here because of tiebreakers, unfortunately for them. Uh, But I think they're an underrated team in a lot of ways. I think people are overreacting to the the Hopkins trade. You could actually make an argument that their receiving core is better next year, despite not having Hopkins. Um, You know, you could could put extra weight in having that true number one. Um, But anyway, I mean, you have Fuller. You have Stills, you have Randall Cobb, you have Kiki Kuti, you have David Johnson, Duke Johnson. There's a lot of speed on this offense with one of the best quarterbacks in the league, with one of the better offensive minds in the league in Bill O'Brien. If their defense can just be okay, this can be a really good football team. And then you have Tennessee, who I think is poised for obvious, you know, regression in a lot of lights. Uh, I have them win nine and seven again. I, I think I've predicted them to go nine and seven like four years in a row. So let's just keep that thing going. I think they'll be really solid, like top 12 on both sides of the ball, but I don't think they're elite on either side. I did like the Clowney signing. Another thing that I'll have to talk about on the podcast this week. Uh, Then I have the Colts uh, getting the tiebreakers at nine and seven. Colts are an interesting team this year as well, getting Phillip Rivers in there. Uh, I think the defense will just be really solid. Not a ton of superstars there, but if the offense can create this run heavy short to intermediate passing game with rivers definitely be more efficient than they were last year i think we're going to see a much better colts team this year so a really tight race like a three-sided die here honestly if whoever you have winning between those three i get it then the afc west i've got the raiders at the bottom at five and eleven decent roster they've done a good job to fill out the depth here but totally uh, lacking star talent. Uh, Derek Carr just does not have that it factor at quarterback to me. I think he's going to kind of put Henry Ruggs to waste um, by not looking his way enough. They have so many good short to intermediate targets and a really good offensive line. So the offense will be solid at worst, but the defense is going to be a train wreck. Pass rush is overrated. Secondary is a mess. I just don't think it's going to be a very good football team. They're slowly building something here. Don't know what the hell the Lynn Bowden trade was about basically wasted a fourth round pick for nothing Uh, but it's the same guys that traded Khalil Mack for a running back so you know is what it is then we've got the Chargers at six and ten I've got serious questions about the quarterback room here I'm not a Justin Herbert believer I think it will be Tyrod Taylor for if not the majority of the season the entire season and then you add the Derwin James injury to the mix which takes some of that shine off of the secondary it's still a very good secondary with a great pass rush in front of it this has been a historically soft defense in a lot of, you know I got to say that lightly because they've had some really good defensive games but there's a lot of weeks where you can physically dominate this Chargers team and I think losing Derwin James is just a, another reason to kind of doubt the Chargers this year definitely a team I'm, I'm kind of fading right now uh, then we got the Denver Broncos at eight and eight I think we're going to see a lot of shine uh, from Drew Locke and this young offense ultimately could leave this team with a really tough decision like I think Drew Locke is going to have some highs and some lows and this defense is going to be really good I just think they're maybe a year away but at the same time it's like if Drew Locke can't be crazy with this receiving core what is he ultimately going to be so it's a really interesting team this year I think they're going to be a really good team at eight and eight but I think they'll just fall short of uh, the sort of playoff expectations that are in place for this team but I will say that they are my Super Bowl long shot pick this year. So while I'm not necessarily standing by it, if everything clicks here, this is a roster with if Drew Locke can blow up in the light of Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes. And I I think that that's a possibility. If that could happen, I think this team could be a Super Bowl team. Then we got the Kansas City Chiefs. No surprise, the last team we talk about here, 13-3, and locked and loaded for a repeat. Mahomes coming fresh off the contract. Everything's still intact here. The only thing they really lost was right guard Laurent Duvernay Tardif, but I like the Kalecki Assemble signing. I think he'll plug right in there. Defensively, they're getting everybody back. Adding Willie Gay to the mix, potentially. Uh, yeah, this is the best team in football right now, and we get to see him in three days. All right, on to the playoffs. We're going to start on the AFC side, mix it up a little bit. Uh, so Ravens, Titans. 
again, only one first round buy with this new seven team playoff format. <laughs> and uh, Ravens fans are like, oh God, he's going to do it, isn't he? He's going to pick the Titans to repeat what happened last year. They showed that they match up really well with the Ravens. And yeah, you're right. I'm going to do it. I think the Titans are potentially the only team in the AFC that could truly stop the Ravens again because of Mike Vrabel and how he's built that front seven. Adding Jadavian Clowney to the mix, I don't think this is a matchup that's going to help Lamar Jackson get over the hump and actually win a playoff game. I think we're going to see another first round exit here if it's Tennessee. That's the one team the Ravens did not want to see here. And unfortunately, it's just a matter of matchups. So the Titans are going to advance. Then we have the Steelers visiting the Indianapolis Colts. In this one, the uh, AFC South is going to lose to the AFC North. The Steelers are going to advance. That defense getting to Phillip Rivers a little bit too much. Quick hitting passing game there for the Steelers. Uh, going to be able to um, get enough to knock off the Colts. Then the Patriots and Bills, an AFC East battle. The Patriots having to go on the road here. Uh, but like I said, I think the Patriots are, are one of these teams that's going to be much better in December than they are in September. It may have lost them the division here, but I do think it will win them this game. I think they'll have a true identity. I think as we've seen plenty of times, Bill Belichick will get this defense going by the end of the year. It's going to be too much for Josh Allen to overcome, and the Bills will be looking at another first-round exit. Next up, we've got the Packers hosting the Buccaneers, very much like the Baltimore Ravens. Maybe the one team outside of uh, San Francisco that the, the Packers did not want to see here. Uh, the Packers just can't really match up with this Bucs team. Trying to cover both Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. I think Tom Brady's going to start cooking, uh, you know, in the second half of the season. And the Packers defense, just no matter how well they play in the regular season, they always seem to disappoint come playoff time. And uh, this just has... Another disappointing loss for Green Bay, written all over it. Then we've got the Eagles hosting the defending NFC champion, San Francisco 49ers, hopefully getting healthy and hot down the, the stretch here. And I do have the Niners going into Philadelphia and picking up a win. Definitely a game you could see some of those uh, injuries that uh, Philadelphia has already witnessed on the offensive line uh, stack up. With that great pass rush in San Francisco, Kyle Shanahan's always going to be able to manufacture some points, even against a good defense in Philadelphia. Definitely a good matchup, but I'm going to take the Niners. Then we've got the Seahawks hosting the ever-so-talented Dallas Cowboys. I think Russ has the uh, overall talent around him this time against Dallas uh, to match that loaded roster. And it'll be a close game, but down the stretch, I'm taking Russell Wilson at home against Dak Prescott. Uh, every day of the week. So there's your first round. Let's get back to the AFC side. Remember, they reseed in the NFL. There's always a few comments to say, oh, you, you moved them up incorrectly. No, they play the, you know, they match the highest seed with the lowest seed. So it's going to be the Kansas City Chiefs hosting the Tennessee Titans, being the beneficiary of the upset again this year. Uh, and I don't see much of a competition again this time around. I think Kansas City uh, has showed why that's not a particularly good matchup for Ryan Tannehill to try and keep pace with Patrick Mahomes. Uh, then you have the Patriots visiting the Pittsburgh Steelers, a couple of wild card teams here. As good of a tackling team as the Patriots are that should be able to keep the score down in this one. I just see the Steelers defense that if they have a problem, it's in the secondary, but matched up against a bunch of trash cans at receiver. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, and I think the Steelers could win this one like nine to six or something pretty crazy, but uh, will advance there to the AFC championship. Then on the NFC side, a couple of divisional battles here in the NFC West and the NFC South. Uh, so it's going to be the Bucks visiting the New Orleans Saints. And I just think this Bucks team is, is going to get hot down the stretch. They will have a lot to figure out earlier in the year, and it's, it's going to leave them to being a wild card team here. But I think Tom Brady, as far as that arm talent over the season, uh, as the season goes on, he hasn't had the same problems that Drew Brees has had. And I'm comfortable saying that the Saints just are not the same come playoff time as they are when the season starts. And I don't see that being much different here. I think the Bucs will be the more explosive offense. I think defensively, they'll have grown to a point of matching the Saints defense as well. 
So I think the Saints are the regular season team in the NFC South, and I think the Bucks are the postseason team in the NFC South. Tom Brady is going to go to the NFC Championship here in his first year with Tampa. Uh, then we have Seattle hosting the, the San Francisco 49ers. Seattle was the one team last year that really showed the ability in the NFC to, to beat the Niners. Russell's kind of fearlessness, avoiding that lethal pass rush, and a defense that uh, didn't necessarily get duped by all of Kyle Shanahan's trickery. It's a good matchup for Seattle. They've built well to hang with the Niners, and now they have Jamal Adams to match uh, George Kittle. So I think Seattle has done a really good job to prepare for this matchup, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. They're going to win this game. So AFC Championship, we've got Steelers at Chiefs and Bucks at Seahawks. On the AFC side, I'm going to have the Chiefs defeating the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pretty easy decision there. I just don't think the Steelers have the offensive firepower uh, to match the Chiefs or the guys in the secondary to contain these receivers. I think that's a pretty bad matchup for the Pittsburgh Steelers, to be honest. Then we have the Bucks visiting the Seahawks. Maybe the hardest matchup to evaluate here. It is also my opinion that the crowds are going to be a lot more relevant this late in the season. That is very controversial and up in the air, but um, I think that could be what might give the nod to Seattle is if they do have a true home field advantage. We've seen what Seattle in the playoffs can look like, uh, so certainly would help. You also have a potentially cold, wet, outdoor game that Despite what we said about Tom Brady versus Drew Brees, Tom Brady is still 43 years old, and I don't know if he's going to go out uh, and have the same passing ability that that a Russell Wilson does. So I think there's some factors here that lean towards Seattle that are tough to predict here in September. Seattle's also traditionally been a very good tackling team that I think can match up well uh, with a potentially more of a short to intermediate passing game uh, with the Bucks. The Bucks to me, also don't have that elite pass rush um, that is kind of how you beat Seattle a lot of times. So this would be a hell of a game, um, but I am going to take the Seattle Seahawks to get to Super Bowl 45. And that leaves us with Chiefs Seahawks, a battle of the two best quarterbacks in the NFL. And to me, uh, if you want to talk about awards, you're talking about the two leading MVP candidates with Mahomes and Russell Wilson. Hell of a game here, but I am going to go with Kansas City repeating as Super Bowl champions, something we have very rarely seen in this league. But man, I just think that this team has not even reached their potential offensively, which sounds crazy. But two years ago, it was, it was Mahomes' first year as a starter. Last year, they had so many injuries and they still won the Super Bowl. I think luck's going to swing back the other way and this team is just going to fly all year. And it's just going to be too much for a really good Seahawks team to handle. So there are your 2020 predictions. So excited to see this thing play out. Please do hit that like button if you enjoyed. Obviously comment your predictions down below. We'll be back with more content this week. So make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss uh, the rest of these predictive videos and NFL analysis. But until then guys, cheers and we'll see you later. Peace out.